And we are live. Good afternoon, uh, good morning um, to all of our listeners tuning in from all around Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific Island. My name is Giovanni Ferrante. I look after marketing for SIPS in this region and it's a pleasure to be your host for today. This session is a very special one, really close to SIPS's heart. And we will be talking about social procurement. So understanding what it is and providing some example on how it can impact business, the society, and what some of the levers are. Social procurement is effectively when organizations use their buying power, not only to generate business outcome, but to benefit the broader society. And today we have two subject matter experts that will guide us through the concept of social procurement and some of the ins and outs of the discipline. The two guests that we have today are Mark Daniels, Executive Director Bioservices at Social Traders, and Joe Tabard, Senior Manager given the chance, Employment with Social Impact at Brotherhood of St. Lawrence. A little bit about our speakers today. Mark has worked in the field since 2001, and over that time he has produced from social enterprise, run social enterprise, lobbied for social enterprise, and help fund social traders, Australia's leading social enterprise development organization. Mark's works now center on enabling government and business buyers to build social enterprise into their supply chains. Social Traders Marketplace has enabled 70 businesses and government buyer members to work with over 330 certified social enterprises in the last two years. A little bit about Joe. Joe Tabbitt has also created what was then the largest employment and advocacy program for people seeking asylum, given the chance for asylum seeker. Funded from 2012 to 2017 by a single private philanthropist. The program supported 545 job seekers into work and achieved a rate of 68% for job retention to 26 weeks. Joe currently manages three Jobs Victoria Employment Network programs for diverse job seekers in Melbourne, Whittlesea, Dandenong and Flemington. And they're given the chance social enterprise incorporating a group training organization and supported labor hire programs for a range of partner employers such as INZ, Citywide, John Holland, Parks Victoria and cities of Melbourne and Yarra. Now, a few housekeeping. The webinar will be recorded today and we will have an opportunity to ask some questions at the end of the presentation. And Mark and Joe will endeavor to answer as many as possible. So with any further ado, I'm just gonna hand over to Mark. Thank, Thank you for joining and over to you. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, and hello to everyone who's listening. Uh, I'm going to kick off uh, covering, I guess, a big picture. Of, so this is really designed, as Jess said, as an introduction to social procurement. So I want to set the scene a little bit. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about who we are, um, but I really want to spend most of the time on social procurement. And then we're going to hear from Joe, and Joe's going to talk about the social enterprise that she runs and the other work they do around social procurement. And then we'll come back and look at some best practice, I guess, in this space. So first of all, I, this is my organisation. This is what we do. We run a marketplace um, and we work with buyers to build social enterprises into their supply chains. That's why we exist and we're a not-for-profit. So we exist to create social impact and the impact that's delivered is when the social enterprises win work, they are able to scale the social impacts that they deliver. And I'll talk about how they do that in a minute, what types of social enterprises there are. Uh, we do four things with buyers. So we've got about 70 buyers that we work with. We give them access to certified social enterprises. We have about 330 of those. We uh, run networking events where buyers meet suppliers. We're actually running one right now in Melbourne, but we do it in uh, uh, Mel uh, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, and soon to be in South Australia. 
of our, uh, we do strategy development. So we help uh, people around opportunity analysis, uh, our buyers, and we do some strategy work with them to realise those opportunities. Staff engagement's a real barrier for organisations. So getting staff over the line through workshops, training and network events. And lastly, we do stuff around leadership. So we bring together our buyer members so they can learn from each other and, and see what best practice is in this space. Um, we also work with social enterprises. So we certify those businesses and ensure that, you're, uh, this, that you know, a, an organisation is a social enterprise that a buyer is buying from. Uh, and we are doing uh, skills development with those organisations and enabling them to access the marketplace that we operate in. Um, some of our buyers are, uh, well, all of our buyers are listed on this slide. So it just gives you a taste of the sorts of organisations that we're working with. And for those in New Zealand, there's an equivalent organisation in New Zealand called Akina, who are working with a number of social enterprises and buyers in New Zealand to, to make um, social procurement happen and happen. So I just want to move away from my organisation and, and I won't be talking about social traders per se for the rest of the presentation, but I kind of wanted you to understand who we were and what our, our background is. We've been working in space for about four years and I've been working it for about 20 years now in various roles. I want to focus the rest of this on social procurement and, and drill down into social enterprise in particular. So Gio touched on what, a social, what social procurement is it's, it's not a really revelationary, a, re, a, revel, a revelatory idea. It is just that you buy stuff all the time uh, and it's when you intentionally go out to generate social value above and beyond the value of the goods or services being procured. So the social impact that you're seeking can be delivered by social enterprises. It could be delivered by indigenous owned businesses, could be delivered by Australian disability enterprises, or it could be through the direct employment of disadvantaged people. We've also seen social procurement in local and regional areas where local business and local content become the focus of social procurement. It really is whatever sort of social mission is driving you to do this and building that into your procurement process so you're able to achieve it. It generally means these three things. Uh, and so social procurement can be done uh, as a way of keeping money in local economies. And that's often through having local content requirements in a, an RFT or preferencing local businesses in local communities. And often that happens in rural and regional areas or in areas experiencing specific level, high levels of disadvantage, even in metro areas. The second cohort is around, um, or the second uh, motivation is employment for marginalised groups. And so that could be uh, about creating jobs for disadvantaged cohorts. So that could be any, uh, could be we want to create jobs for disadvantaged or there are particular cohorts of disadvantage we want to create jobs for. For example, public housing tenants or long-term unemployed or migrants and refugees and asylum seekers or indigenous Australians or people exiting the justice system, uh, women, uh, it could be a whole range of different cohorts that are, are, are the focus. And this is usually achieved through direct employment of disadvantaged people through the supply chain or into the business, or it could be through engaging a social enterprise in your supply chains. And the third area is around economic empowerment. And in Australia, that just generally means Indigenous businesses. In uh, New Zealand, it's starting to mean Indigenous businesses. In the, UK, in the US, it actually means any minority owned business. So if you're African American owned business, a Latino American owned business, or a Native American owned business, you get preference. We're starting to see some of our corporate buyers preferencing women owned businesses. And even uh, there's discussion around mig uh, uh, migrant and refugee owned businesses as well being preference. So social procurement can be used in a whole range of ways. And you certainly don't have to achieve all three of these out, uh, objectives. You can say, we're really into economic empowerment. That's the focus we wanna have. We want indigenous businesses in our supply chain, or it can all be around local, uh, it, it, but we are seeing businesses increasingly doing all of these things. This is just a conceptual diagram of the, 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 the concept of procurement being separated from CSR or community services in an organisation. So we tend to operate in silos and organisations. And what we're talking about in social procurement is actually saying, well, that road that we're going to build 
what social impacts could it have above and beyond the, the, the value that any road provides, which is making transport easier fundamentally. So can we create jobs for disadvantaged people, for example, through the creation of this road? Can we, reduce, can we use uh, recycled materials to reduce carbon footprint? Can we uh, you know, uh, ensure that there's a local benefit left in this community as a result of this process? I want to just touch on social enterprise now. So I've, I've referred to it. Um, usually when I walk into a room, I could uh, ask people in the room what a social enterprise, uh, who knows what a social enterprise is, probably half will put their hand up. If I ask them to explain what it is, I will probably get as many answers as there are hands in the air. So <laughs> everyone will have a different view of what this is simply because, um, it, you know, it's, it's not a clearly, it's, it's, you know, it's getting, greater presence in people's consciousness, but they don't necessarily think of it from a definition perspective. We've started to think of it, and we always have actually as an organisation from a definitional perspective, because there is now benefit that is conferred on social enterprises. So certification actually becomes very important because uh, you don't want to get social wash. We've had green wash before in the indigenous space. They talk about black cladding, a business that looks like an indigenous business on the outside, but in, on the inside, it really isn't an indigenous owned business. So we set up a certification process and that's part, it's a big chunk of what we do to give buyers comfort that they know they're buying from a social enterprise. And this is what we certify against. Those three dot points are the criteria that we certify against and we certify the Brotherhood St. Lawrence and Joe's uh, social enterprise against this criteria. So, uh, and this definition has come, it's internationally comparable and it came out of research with a professor of social enterprise, Joe, Par Joe Barraquet. She's probably the most eminent uh, academic in the social enterprise space in Australia and perhaps the world. So they have three uh, key requirements if you want to be a social enterprise. You have to have a defined primary social purpose, an environmental or other public benefit. So you exist for public benefit, not shareholder return. That's your primary reason for existence. The second point is that a substantial proportion of your income is from trade. This is kind of about welfare. Social enterprises aren't welfare organisations, but they can be owned by welfare organisations. So the Brotherhood of St Lawrence is a welfare organisation, but the group training company that, that they run and given the chance aren't welfare programs. They're businesses, they compete in the open marketplace and most of if not all of their revenue comes through trading activities through customers. The last point is that they reinvest 50% or more of any annual profits towards achieving their purpose. It's really consistent with the first point. They are mainly altruistic businesses. So they can have shareholders, but the majority of their profit will go to their mission, not to their shareholders. We have social enterprises that are for profit. Every company form, we have social enterprises in. Um, most are not for profits. 80% of the social enterprises we certified are not for profit organisations. Uh, we, most social enterprises are motivated by one of three things. And the three buckets represent those three things. So one is employment. So a social enterprise exists to create employment and training for marginalised groups. Okay, there is a big chunk of those. In fact, I'll get the stats up there. 62% of the social enterprises we've certified uh, exist to create jobs for disadvantaged cohorts or training opportunities. The second bucket is around community need, and that's a product or service that isn't being uh, provided by the market. Okay, so the competitive marketplace and all those commercial businesses aren't meeting a need in the marketplace. An example would be a childcare provider. So, you know, childcare providers can make money in a community where they can see a profit margin above X percent. A social enterprise uh, could operate in an environment where the profit margin is one or two percent. They simply need enough money to be able to sustain the business. They don't have to do shareholder payments, for example. So they can meet needs where the market can't meet needs. And the third group is around profit redistribution. So 13% of our social enterprises uh, run businesses and there is no social impact in the operations of the business. It's what they do with the profit that is the social impact. Probably one of the most famous of those in, in Australia is the thank you group. So they do water and nappies and um, soaps and they're in Woolies and Coles and, and now they're in New Zealand too, actually. And uh, you know, 100% of their profits go to water aid projects, food projects and sanitation projects in developing countries, just to give you an example of how that works. 
So just a little bit about the social enterprises we've certified. Um, they operate in every industry nationally. So in every category, you will find social enterprises. They won't necessarily be in every geographical location though. The beneficiaries are really diverse and it can be everything from the environment and, uh, and cultural outcomes, but more often than not, it's employment and disadvantaged cohorts that are benefiting from social enterprises. And our goal as an organisation, uh, I won't go into this too much, but we want to grow the number of certified social enterprises by 2025. I want to stop there. I've given you some background to social enterprise, and I think it'd be really valuable now to hear from one of the leading social enterprises that we work with, and I'll pass over to Jo. Hi. Thank you, Mark. That's a very nice endorsement. Um, I'm Jo Tabbitt. I'm the Senior Manager of our Given the Chance Social Enterprise, um, and I've been... Um, facilitating this enterprise for quite some years in the Brotherhood, and I can certainly reflect upon um, the changes I've seen in the procurement environment in Victoria in particular over that time. Um, so, oh, sorry, I've um, clicked the wrong thing. Uh, wrong mouse. Wrong mouse. Right. Sorry, right. technical difficulties nearly there. Perfect. Um, so as Mark mentioned, we are a social enterprise which is nested within a broader welfare organisation, the Brotherhood of St Lawrence. So the, uh, besides our general purpose of employing or supporting the employment of disadvantaged people um, across our business, um, we also exist to um, create systemic change. So the Brotherhood is, is an organisation which is very much focused on that. It's got something like 70 researchers. Um, even just this week, I was called up and asked to contribute to a report which is going to be sent to federal government about the progress in Victoria around social procurement. So it's very much a part of why we exist. Um, uh, so who are we and what do we do? So essentially we are a, a labour market intermediary. We're an organisation which exists to enable employers um, to take on disadvantaged people. And, and the reason we sort of went down that track some years back was because in the broader employment sector, there was very little successful liaison with employers. The Commonwealth system, job active system, only liaised with 4% of employers. Um, so an employer wishing to take on diverse candidates, disadvantaged people, um, whilst they might be able to purchase via a social enterprise, if they wanted to take someone from a disadvantaged background on themselves, there was very little for them to turn to in terms of, well, how do I actually access a refugee or someone seeking asylum? How do I um, find someone with a disability who's suitable for my business? Um, you know, whilst you can make changes um, to your systems and processes, and those can be really important changes, having good policies, having good systems for embracing diversity, the reality is, um, you know, if you're a bank branch in Coburg, for example, um, and you put out a role for a teller, or what used to be a teller, nowadays it's a universal banker, they all have to do everything, um, they would get, you know, 3,000 applications. So the application from a refugee or a um, Indigenous candidate isn't going to find its way to the top of the list. So doing this sort of work does mean setting up an alternate recruitment um, process. And it does mean understanding the cohort you're trying to support. So how, if your business isn't supporting those cohorts, how do you do that? So what we did is we set up our enterprise um, to be able to deliver labour hire services and offset risk. So essentially performing that function of offsetting risk for the employer to take on a candidate. We do fixed term labour hire rather than sort of casual on call. So we ask for a, a, a defined period, usually six months, um, over which the employer gets to try out the, say, refugee or candidate with a disability, um, whichever cohort they're interested in, um, and then ideally take them on directly into their workplace once they've been fully supported by our model over this six-month period. Um, the same with um, traineeships and apprenticeships, um, essentially providing on-the-job experience coupled with essential qualifications um, and, and, and usually pre-vocational training, which is... Um, you know, tied in with the certificate that they go on to the job with. So um, we are a registered group training organisation, as Mark mentioned. Um, we're a little bit different from the broader GTO network in that we don't just deal with um, youth coming out of the schools. We um, look at all the, um, we look at mature age people in traineeships and apprenticeships, as well as um, younger people from disadvantaged cohorts. And there's a picture there of one of our labour hire candidates in McConnell Dow, um, who's been and that's been a very successful relationship for us in the Western Program Alliance. 
sorry, I'm doing the same thing with my thing. So in, so in terms of the business model and what we offer, um, for a, a program to be given the chance program, there's four key models that we offer to the employer. Um, participant training, where we prepare the person for the job. Um, employer training, where we, where we prepare the employer for taking on um, disadvantaged people. So, you know, what does that mean for your strategies in management? Um, a lot of that sort of work is actually about um, demystifying the issue and making sure that the employers proactively support and supervise the person rather than going, I'm a little bit scared because that's person, that person is a refugee and I might hurt them if I mention, you know, that they're not meeting this expectation or whatever the case may be. A lot of that is actually about empowering them to give more information during the placement period rather than less so that they don't end up sabotaging the placement. Um, work placement support, so each person gets a field officer. Who, um, who troubleshoots any issues. It means the person's got someone to disclose any personal issues that might be getting in, way, in the way of the placement. They can understand what's appropriate to say to their supervisor and what's appropriate to, set, to keep to themselves. And then transition support either directly into a job with the employer or if they've learned that they want to go in a different direction, we can then support them into a different direction. And that again means that the employer doesn't um, have to be concerned with what happens to that candidate. They know they're supported. Um, so in order to do that successfully, we have an employer engagement team, which is specialised in building their knowledge of industry and cohort. Um, we can also source an employer apprentices and trainees to meet the major project skills guarantee, which is a big part of the procurement framework. Um, as a social enterprise, we can be part of the nominal 3% spend on social enterprises, which the procurement framework advises. Um, and we can provide lots of advice on who to target. And often when you're talking with employers in say a bidding phase, um, they're wanting to do something which will look really good to government. And often, um, so they might say, oh, we'll just do this targeted program with the Sudanese community without sort of, you've also got to think about how many Sudanese you've got in your community. Um, and whether you should broaden that out a bit, you know, if you provide a lot of jobs in one community and then you're someone in that community who hasn't succeeded in that job, that can have an adverse effect. So th that sort of advice around who, who they, um, who they um, should support. So in the last two financial years, we've um, placed over 300 people with 43 different host employers. We have a flagship program with the ANZ Bank, which has had very high retention rates into the bank. Um, average rates for secondary employment um, have been as high as 75% generally, whereas the Commonwealth system has only achieved about um, 30%. Um, and also the apprenticeship rate is fairly good for us because the national rate for apprenticeship re retention is as low as 50%. So we've sort of definitely managed to outperform the general stats. The employers we work with, um, here are some of the logos for the employers we're working with, and those partnerships are, are really critical. Um, in terms of our business model, we're more expensive at the front end um, because of all the additional support, the employer training and what have you. So our own cap costs, while they're um, comparable with industry rates, um, I wouldn't say they're low. Um, and at the back end, at the back end we we have a slight difference to our business model in that we don't charge release fees, for example, in a labour hire equation, because we don't want there to be any barrier to the person getting an ongoing job. So overall, I would say we're actually more economical than the general labour hire environment. Um, in, in the professional services area, there can be some really big wins um, for employers. We recently um, got a new program up with Arup, which is a design and engineering company, and we actually ended up with one candidate in a bidding war, war between Arup and another infrastructure. You know, both of them offering more money and more um, time in their contracts, things like that. So, you know, it, it, there can be some surprising results for employers, but at the same time, employers shouldn't think that they can continue doing what they always do. Um, and um, have, the, have these kinds of models work and succeed. You do have to, there is a cultural shift requirement um, to take on disadvantaged job seekers and our, I guess our main offer is to support them through that process. Um, another example of an employer we're working with is Borrell and in terms of the infrastructure spend, concrete for example is a pretty big material in the in the overall spend. Someone told me it was as high as 20%. I'm not sure if that's true, Mark. No, not true. No, so no. Uh, there you go. I'm telling a few. No, there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but you can imagine there would be a lot of concrete um, involved in yeah. these projects. Um, so we have um, facilitated administration roles in Borrell's quarries in Deer Park and in head office and also yard persons, general crew members for Borrell Asphalt. Um, and, you know, the uh, Borrell as an employer, you know, have been really excited by the diversity. So they've, you know, a quote we had from our employer there is that they've found so many candidates out there with untapped talent um, that they didn't realise were accessible. Um, so that's been a really good example. Another key example, and this was pre the framework, um, through some of the work we do with councils, um, Melton City Council was, um, the city of Yarra, who, who we'd been working with for some years, actually advocated to them around embedding procurement in their six years roads, drainage, maintenance. Um, and so they embedded a, a, a procurement requirement um, for 10% of the workforce, uh, assisting them in that large LGA um, to be uh, from the Melton municipality and from disadvantaged backgrounds. So we've been maintaining about nine employees um, with citywide in a range of roles, horticulture, civil construction, um, all that sort of thing. So um, yeah, that some of those models have been very successful. That's great. Thanks, mm, Joe. No I appreciate it. Uh, and you can ask Joe questions in a few. No, probably got about ten minutes to go. Yeah. I'm going to come back to social procurement. So we've touched on social enterprise a bit. Um, really keen to to round out sort of why people do social procurement and, and what some of the challenges are. This is really uh, uh, the things that come up when we work with buyers as to their motivation. So, um, and how much weighting I would place on each really just differs on the company or the organisation. Um, so staff attraction retention is something significant for people. Um, and we've had a few who have actually joined, uh, become members of social traders on the back of, we want to engage our staff more effectively in this. They're asking to participate in this. Graduates coming out of university are now looking for companies that do these sorts of things. Um, customers, competitive advantage is significant. So we have 70 buyers, some of those buyers sell to each other as well and they're asking for social um, uh, requirements in the RFTs that they're putting out to one another as well. So we're starting to see a number of our customers coming to us because they can see competitive advantage either in moving first in this marketplace or responding to RFTs that are asking for this sort of requirement. Uh, government is moving down this path um, increasingly um, and it's driven by efficiency. So if you can buy a road and these other social impacts, why wouldn't you do that? If you can buy paper and social impacts, if you can buy catering and social impacts, if the price is the same, uh, the added value is, 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 is significant. And it's about thinking, I guess, more uh, uh, innovatively around uh, the way you do things. And that's what we're starting to see being driven. Shareholders and investors are starting to ask for this stuff. It's early days, but some of the biggest investors in the world, like BlackRock, are actually starting to say, we don't just look for, uh, you know, um, for ROI, we also look for social returns as well from the companies that we invest in. And I guess historically, the mining and minerals industry have been the kings of this space, and social license was their driver around that. And that was fundamentally about, well, if we're going into an indigenous area, uh, we need to make sure we're creating jobs and legacy uh, and leaving that behind when we're uh, finished in, in, in our work. So, um, you know, th these are generally sort of the motivations that we're seeing, but increasingly this last one is coming up too, which is we should just do this. This makes sense. This is the right thing to do. Uh, look, this is just a snapshot of Victoria's social procurement framework. Joe's alluded to it. Um, we're starting to see other governments doing this as well, and I'll touch on what some of the other governments are doing. But this was just, it's really just a thematic around how they see social procurement and what uh, target thresholds, um, uh, uh, the require, how requirements fit in at particular target thresholds. So it's moving from encouraged to proportionate to targeted to quite strategic in large projects and contracts. Um, they have a framework in Victoria that requires every department to develop a social procurement strategy and uh, that uh, column down the left hand side has things like social enterprises, ADEs, Aboriginal businesses, disadvantaged communities, gender, disability, family, violence, leave, fair and safe workplaces, environmental sustainability and climate change. They are the objectives of the framework. So different government departments will attach more weight to different priorities. Um, but in the end, 
what is fundamentally shifting is that the Victorian government is now saying we buy based on price, risk and social benefit. So it's a significant shift in thinking. They're not alone though. Um, oh, it's, yeah, just looking for another slide. Let me talk to this really briefly. Um, uh, the federal government has been a real leader in Indigenous procurement. So ignore the rock stars for a minute. Um, I'll come back to that. The federal government has had the Indigenous procurement policy in Australia now since FY16. In FY15, they spent uh, $5 million with Indigenous businesses. In, since FY16 to FY19, they've spent $2 billion with Indigenous businesses. So the growth in spend has been absolutely phenomenal and fundamentally driven by a recognition that a lot of Indigenous economic participation uh, strategies have failed. Mm. But in the US, the minority supplier model has worked incredibly well at creating wealth and uh, uh, role models in uh, African American, Latino American communities by growing spends with those businesses. And so they've adopted a similar strategy in Australia and it's been phenomenally successful. We're also seeing things like uh, the new ISO standards. So ISO, uh, you would all know because you're working procurement. Um, but ISO created a new standard in 2017 called ISO 2400 Sustainable Procurement. And the Sustainable Procurement Guidelines are an amazing uh, resource. Um, and what is super exciting about them is that they treat sustainability equally in terms of environmental, social and economic. Um, and I guess for us, the language of sustainability has always been environmental. Um, and now we're starting to see it truly meaning triple bottom line. And that's really exciting. So there's now an international framework in response to industry that outlines how to do this uh, within a procurement team most effectively. I've seen that adopted by an organization called ISCA in Australia. They were one of the first adopters. They're the Infrastructure Sustainability Council of Australia. And what they do is they work on infrastructure projects to score a project in terms of its environmental standards. And they have adopted, uh, so what we're now seeing is pretty much every environment, every major infrastructure project in Australia has social, environmental and economic social procurement targets that they need to deliver on, which is really terrific. We're basically seeing at a government level, most states adopting this to some extent. Uh, you know, it might focus on long-term unemployed in South Australia. It might be about reskilling out of the manufacturing industry in WA. It's got a much stronger focus on Indigenous businesses and Aboriginal participation. It tends to tailor to what the issues are in those jurisdictions and how they can address those issues as well. So it's sort of growing in importance. Just this slide I've got in front now, who are some of the rock stars? I could go into many different uh, companies. Uh, um, probably Fortescue is the biggest spender with uh, Indigenous businesses in Australia and they've re repeatedly gotten awards from uh, Supply Nation in recognition of their spend, which is over 200 million a year with Indigenous businesses. The Level Crossing Removal Project in Victoria spent over 100 million on social procurement in the last 30 months, really significant. And it's a mixture of Indigenous businesses, social enterprises um, and jobs for disadvantaged cohorts. We've seen uh, broad spectrum, one of our buyer members spent 30 and a half million with social enterprises in the last two years. Uh, John Holland have got over 25 social enterprises in their supply chain on a $1 billion infrastructure project. Australia Post has used a range of approaches to build over 35 social enterprises and indigenous businesses into their supply chains and have moved from spends of 3 million to 5.6 to 20 million in three years. So, it's not actually always about big spends. These guys are spending big quantities. Uh, you know, we see some of the buyers we work with are spending uh, two or 300,000 a year with social enterprise. That's quite often a starting point for a, a, an organization. But uh, there's a maturity process and over time we start to see it rolling out into, into other um, um, parts of the organization. Um, this is just a slide I like talking about because um, procurement in Australia is around $600 billion a year. Um, and we think that um, it is really the greatest untapped tool for social impact. So in, in the sector that Joe works in, and I used to work with her at the Brothers of St. Lawrence, um, everyone scrambles around for government funding, which is a finite resource and it gets smaller rather than bigger. 
what's exciting about procurement is there's $600 billion that really has not been used to generate any significant social impact. And we're starting to see the sort of scale and impact it could deliver. Spending $2 billion through the federal government with Indigenous businesses over the last three years have had a staggering effect. And on Close the Gap reports in Australia, that will be one of their, that's mentioned as one of their most significant achievements in closing the gap around Indigenous economic participation in Australia. And I guess just to finish, um, you know, this is the impact that we've had over the last two years. So social traders at the end of FY18 and 19, we had 53 business and government members and 290 certified social enterprises. We enabled $105 million spend between those organisations and that created 700 jobs for disadvantaged Australians, over 220,000 hours of employability skills training. So those people often aren't ready for a job yet, but the training is the pathway to the job for those people. We've had 8 million in free or low cost goods and services uh, provided to not-for-profit and uh, uh, people and disadvantaged people in the community and over 2 million in funds distributed to charitable purposes. That's a pretty good return for 105 million in spend. So you can sort of see the multiplier of this. If everyone's doing this, we actually make a dent in disadvantage in Australia and in New Zealand in quite a significant way. Gia. <laughs> that was absolutely fantastic and I've, uh, I've absolutely loved the plug around procurement and the opportunities that we have as a profession to come together and impact way beyond um, you know, the reward of our own businesses but actually create a meaningful and sustainable impact for the, the society and the world we live in. So this sits at the core of our mission as well. Uh, yeah. We are uh, a particular type of businesses as well. We have a charitable status that comes with an obligation to actually reinvest a lot of the revenue that are generated um, to produce and support the profession by way of sharing knowledge, doing things like we're doing yeah. today uh, that contributes to people's understanding of how uh, we can actually contribute to a broader picture. So the session has been absolutely amazing. I think um, some of the key takeaways for me were around the myth busting. Uh, there's often a misconception around the fact that social procurement has to cost more yep. or that you know it's comparable to doing charity. We've yep. seen that it's exactly the opposite of yep. it. It can be more economically efficient, but also it can be um, easily achievable by adopting a different mentality. And this is what you know the government and the society is moving towards yep. by a number of legislation that have come in lately. So it's been a fantastic session. This is the chance for, uh, for the attendees now um, to ask some questions. We already received a number of them, which we'll go through um, as much as, as we possibly can. I want to start with one, and again, we've done some myth busting. What are some of the barriers from your experience that you've encountered in sort of like bringing this movement forward or this philosophy? Do you want to jump on some of that, Joe? Because I, I can, I can briefly comment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I think you know, it, at, uh, the the thing which keeps cropping up for me is is the whole issue of the cultural shift that. Um, that needs to take place for, you know, businesses and corporate communities to really embrace what we're talking about. And I think really the biggest, the big challenge is the shifting economy and the, the changing labour market and the sort of ever increasing pressure that employers feel to, you know, to, to do things more economically and more efficiently. Um, so a lot of employers you talk to, you know, they've got, they've just won this contract. They want to, they want to hit the ground running with their whole staff team. Um, they've got to meet these key milestones and that's what they're focused on. So getting them to think about um, social um, inclusion, it ends up going sort of further and further down the list of um, priorities. So I suppose for us in Victoria, the procurement framework is a bit of a game changer in bringing that imperative sort of up the list um, to becoming more of a business, a necessary business um, objective. Um, so, but there are challenges, you know, yeah, just yeah. with the uh, economy as a whole. And Gia, I mean, mm. from our perspective, it's, it's change, right? Mm. So we might get people in an organisation who are really excited about mm. doing this, but then changing the way they buy is mm. a fundamental uh, <laughs> challenge for any organisation. And, uh, you know, I know everyone listening will identify with that. I mean, we're basically saying 
uh, if you really want to embrace this, you do need to change your systems. Mm -hmm. You need strong leadership in the organisation. You've got to do comms across the organisation because buyers aren't in procurement, they're in other parts of the organisation and those buyers have got to be on board as well as the procurement team. Um, we, uh, uh, we're, we're kind of seeing, um, we see lots of barriers, none of which are insurmountable, mm. but it's the, the, the challenge for someone is, is um, and then there's a natural suspicion as well, right? Mm. So oh, social enterprise, I'm used to working with businesses, you're throwing out another term, mm. I'm naturally suspicious of another term, especially when it employs disadvantaged people or does something like that. So what's the quality that I'm going to get at the end of the day from this supplier? And it's really interesting when they meet a social enterprise, they'll realize that the people they're talking to are really capable. So the management that sits behind them is really fantastic. The training programs that are put in place to support the workers are excellent. They're not going to put someone in a position where they're not able to execute the job. The price is comparable. We actually find meeting a social enterprise or an Indigenous business, whatever it might be, is the best way of myth busting, basically, because these guys are working with some of the biggest companies in Australia and actually they're becoming suppliers of choice. They're not just, we want to work with you because you're a social enterprise and you can deliver social impact. You're actually an amazing business. So we want to use you everywhere across this organisation. I'm sure that's the case with um, yeah. with the, the brotherhood in, mm. in relation to this too. Mm. That's awesome. And that also helps scale the capability yep. of the social enterprise to be able to service a larger market. Yep. So that's mm. that's very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, Alice is asking a brief case study. Alice, we're going to have another session um, early in the new year uh, with a great example of social procurement in action. So. We'll keep that question for, for the next webinar. Um, Alison's asking, uh, how do you make sure that indigenous suppliers are genuine? Do you, for example, you supply nation uh, yep. or other organization? Yep. Yep. Happy to, to um, pick up on that. I mean, so uh, supply nation has an incredibly rigorous process for certifying indigenous businesses. So you can be very confident that when you're using a supply nation certified supplier, they are an indigenous business. Um, there are other channels and networks. So in Victoria, there's an organisation called Kinaway. There's Black Business in Queensland. There's the Aboriginal Chamber of Commerce in New South Wales and other states and jurisdictions have similar processes for certifying and registering those businesses. I don't know how, uh, I, I don't know their processes is as robust as Supply Nations. I don't know the answer. I don't know if they are as robust. But I, would, I believe they are because they're run by government. So you would expect a similar uh, level of, um, of, of uh, scrutiny. But I would say I'm very confident, having worked with Supply Nation and Kinaway, they're very robust certification processes. I would not believe someone who said I'm an Indigenous business if they were not prepared to get certification undertaken, basically. And that has validity and credibility yep. to the process, exactly absolutely. Right. And Joe, very similar questions for you. Do you have like a database of, you know, of people or organisation available across the different labour categories mm -hmm. that people can tap into? Yep. Um, so, yes, we do. We, um, part of um, what helps us a lot is some of the new government funding that's been available in Victoria um, more recently. So. We've got um, three uh, Jobs Victoria employment network sites that are funded by the Victorian state government. Um, so they uh, essentially comprise um, pools of job seeker candidates that we can tap into in Whittlesea, Flemington and um, Dandenong across Melbourne. Um, in terms of our enterprise generally, when we first, so that they're separately funded by the state government, our own social enterprise is completely self um, funded and standing alone. Um, but they can take candidates from those programs. In terms of our enterprise itself, when we first set it up, we set it up to be a non-churn model because in the social enterprise landscape, there are a lot of social enterprises who would take on candidates and then struggle to sort of uh, teach them to, uh, to help them fly, you know, into the mainstream labour market. A lot of people would want to stay in the enterprise and not leave. So our initial... Um, sort of vision was to um, help people in with mainstream employers that they could then get jobs with. So with that retention rate, with a lot of people picking up jobs with the employers that they're hosted with, um, we haven't had as much of an opportunity as I would like to build a database um, of candidates we could place um, repeatedly. 
Um, but now as we're developing a little, little more scale and a little more growth, um, that's an option that we're, we're looking into at the moment. So I wouldn't say we have, you know, the type of database that like a Hudson's or a Hayes has, um, but it is a, you know, it's a scaling issue for us and one which I think will improve as time goes on. Perfect. Mm. And we're getting a lot of requests for, you know, details around supplier and stuff. The, the presentation will be shared after the mm. fact and um, Mark and Joe have both made themselves available for their contact details to be shared so you can reach out to them with specific questions, particularly from our Victorian listener. There's a really interesting question um, and we were talking about that just before we started the webinar. How do you get down the social procurement path when leaders of the organization are resilient because there are some financial mm -hmm. constraints and we're talking about, you know, mm -hmm. GFC and how that changed the dynamics. So what are some of your advices on that space? Look, I mean, um, I think that, well, I think a few things would be the case. One is that some of the early stuff, we, some of the early social procurement we saw was an individual champion in an organization mm -hmm. engaging in our case, a social enterprise. And, uh, so I think individuals have a role to play in this space. Um, we have a pay, we have a cost attached to what we do. At the end of the day, you can get access to our database for two and a half thousand dollars. So if you if you feel like you can champion it within the organisation, or you can, um, or all you need is data on suppliers at two and a half thousand dollars, you can get entry into this space and you can start to engage. So lowest hanging fruit catering, right? Discretionary spend, start to do stuff in your organisation, share the stories of those sorts of things. And it's not just catering, there'll be other discretionary spends in your organisation. It might be paper or test and tag, or, uh, you know, you might be a category manager for uh, FM and you might sort of see a, a building that's become available and, and, you know, there's no cleaning contractor for that or, you know, I'm making up mythical examples here, but <laughs> you can slot social enterprises in. The most important thing is that you then tell that story. The storytelling is incredible. We often do, um, the first thing we do when we get a new buyer member is we run our AVNs through their finance system and more often than not, we discover they're spending, you know, bigger companies over a million dollars with social enterprise. They didn't know that. Mm. They don't, and that's a really good sign because quite often they've one worked through RFT processes. Mm. They haven't even said they're a social enterprise because that's actually worked against them in the mm. past, you know, because of the natural mm. suspicion. And so they've got these beautiful stories in their organization that they now need to package up and tell across the organization. Um, so I would say storytelling becomes just as important as spending money with social enterprises or indigenous businesses or whoever else you are. So be a champion. Um, if you needed access to our data, there is a reasonably accessible data point. I know it's not easy for everyone. Um, and do the things that you can easily change quickly within your sphere of influence or that are discretionary spends in the organization. Any advice from me around, Joe, um, do you wanna Yeah, add no, look, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, it's a different, I think, these, these kinds of projects are framed by a different purpose to the organisation's, um, you know, general purpose, whether it's profit making or, or otherwise. So I think it's about how you frame the undertaking within the organisation and how you utilise costs that are going to be incurred anyway, you know, yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I may add one, again, we, we, we talked about that before, but uh, probably including uh, social enterprise in your uh, process for buying, yep. it might actually be economically efficient. Yep. So, you know, you might yeah. actually alleviate the burden on the financial yep. pressure that the business is under Absolutely. By, by choosing that. And, you know, we were also talking a few weeks back about yeah. the, the positive circle that, you yep. know, also impacts the tax system. So there are, you know, tax benefits oh, yeah. for, the you know, so huge. the, the yeah. savings, you know, at the government level. So it sort of creates a, a positive yeah. loop that feeds back into, into the economy and obviously uh, more so for businesses that are in struggle. It's yeah. Good. I mean, you'd, you'd be surprised, you know, often when there've been cutbacks in ANZ over the years where there's, you know, you hear in the news that 300 people are being made redundant and people will say to me, oh, well, there goes your ANZ program. And actually the opposite has been the case. Yeah. Yep. So, um, you know, it, it, sometimes you might be surprised by how that pans out. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, my last point, I mean, there are really simple projects, just building on what you were saying, Jay, I mean, 
if you've got to get three quotes, why wouldn't you invite a social enterprise? You know, that's a really easy thing or an indigenous business or whatever it is. So just keeping, just opening up your standard processes to social enterprise indigenous businesses makes enormous sense. Yeah. Awesome. Another very important question, because it's all uh, nice and through when we talk about this, but how do you measure the impact? So once you've gone down that path, yeah. do you use any particular tools? You know, yeah. you mentioned about organization that was spending yeah. substantial amount of money and yeah. when I'm aware of that. So yeah. how do you measure the impact? Yeah. So the, the slide that's still up at the moment is how we measure our impact. So we uh, work with all of our social enterprises to understand uh, what one dollar of spend would with them would translate to in terms of social impact. So it might be it creates 30, uh, you know, 30 seconds of work in, in, in Joe's world, for mm. example, for a disadvantaged person. And what that allows us to do is say, well, you spend a hundred thousand dollars with uh, uh, social enterprise X, that means you've created 1.5 jobs for people exiting the justice system, mm. right? So we can actually segment that 700 jobs for disadvantaged right down to cohorts, people with disabilities, Indigenous Australians, uh, you know, um, people with disabilities, uh, um, long-term unemployed and so on. So we actually report back to our buyer members on their social impacts every year mm. so that they can tell the story across mm. their organisation and increasingly we're seeing these things going to annual reports if they're at a significant enough scale. Mm. So had two or three of our buyers who have started to put this into their annual report as well. Mm. That's awesome. Um, the only thing I'd add to that is um, we have done some analysis of, I think you mentioned, Gia, at the beginning, um, an asylum seeker employment program that we um, ran. Um, we did a cost benefit analysis on that that was really looking at what's the uh, return on investment for a participant getting a job which lasts for 26 weeks. Um, and we had KPMG do an independent analysis and they found that for every dollar invested, um, in this case by our private philanthropist, there was a $3.08 return. And that was, only, that was a very conservative analysis because it just used minimum wage um, as the benchmark and looked at the tax inputs, um, the, mm -hmm. the less reliance on, um, uh, on uh, welfare and things like that. Um, when in actual fact, there's a much broader range of impacts in terms of, you know, less, lot, there's lots of research to show that a job means less um, engagement with health services and less, you know, better mental health outcomes. And there's all sorts of filter effects as well in the way that that person's connection to a, to a job impacts on their general communities. Yeah. And a lot of these disadvantaged communities are very intent on helping their community, giving back to the people around them. So it's hard to quantify some of those less tangible benefits, but even when you just look at basic things like tax inputs and things like that, there's quite a substantial return to government and the community more broadly. Yeah, that, mm. that makes, that makes mm. perfect sense. Mm. Uh, now, as probably you often are on the other side of the table answering tenders, um, and there's a, there's a very interesting question, how, can procurement policies be more flexible or improved to uh, allow for better inclusion of social procurement um, outcomes? Do you have any particular yeah, advice? Yeah. Also, and in particular, uh, I'm thinking about you know a bigger project yeah. where the burden on the organisation, the social enterprise, to actually answer to the tender alone might be huge because it requires a lot of investment, mm -hmm. a lot of time and money. So, what can yeah, some of the things yeah. be? Look, a, a few things. I mean, we've got. We kind of have 10 different approaches to um, uh, writing RFTs or, or, or processes that would, in, would enable social outcomes through that process. Uh, one's about, um, and I'll just go through them, some of them are relevant, some of them aren't, but um, uh, unbundling contracts, so that would be the first one. So quite often the way you buy is just too bulky for any social enterprise or for, for the market to respond, the social enterprise market to respond to an opportunity. So if you've got an FM contract for worth $10 million, there may be one social enterprise in Australia that could engage with you. But if you had, uh, if you broke off one building and had a million dollar contract and a $9 million FM contract that went out to the commercial market, you could find a whole range of social enterprises that can engage. Sometimes it's about bundling. So uh, having uh, work that you can bundle up into a package. So it might be using a discretionary spend like catering and saying, actually, 
if we mass it up, it's a really good predictable revenue stream for one of these organisations. So instead of it being discretionary moving forward, we want to bundle up or we want to create a panel of social enterprises that we're going to do our procurement from. Getting those guys onto your panels, if you use panels, um, so either um, uh, you know uh, having a, 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 an out of turn process to get social enterprises or indigenous businesses onto your panels, um, or including social requirements when you're opening and refreshing the panel. Um, we talk about social weightings in contracts. So, uh, you know, uh, probably insignificant if it's below 5%, although if it's a major contract, probably not. Um, we're starting to see or hear of uh, thoughts within the Victorian government around 8 to 10% social weighting to really generate. We've seen contracts with 30% social weightings built into them. Uh, we've also seen major projects where there are mandatory targets, so they're not, uh, they're written into the contract, not into the RFT, um, but they're outlined in the RFT. So having a 3% target, for example, for social procurement within a major, a billion dollar kind of infrastructure type project, we've seen that sort of stuff written in before. Um, and clauses around second tiering and third tiering, so encouraging the supply chain to um, be opened up to social enterprise. So pushing it down or directly purchasing from. And then this comment I made before, RFQs, where you are going out to three anyway, your requirement is to go out to three, including a social enterprise in that process. I haven't gone through all 10, but I've given you a taste, I guess, of, of yeah. some different approaches that could be taken. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I will make the point, if a social enterprise sees nothing in there about social procurement or social objectives, um, you are just another RFT that they may or may not respond to. So they're looking for something in an RFT that signals to them that their social impact will also be valued in this process. It doesn't mean they wouldn't go for it anyway, if it's a sweet spot for them, that not all their work's coming because people want to yeah. buy from social enterprises, but, but if they're on the edge, they'd be looking for that sort of stuff in particular, where they know that there'll be some kind of preference or recognition of their impact. Yeah. And just to reassure everyone that the webinar is being recorded. And once again, for more specific questions for uh, Mark and Joe, we'll share their contact details and you can um, get in touch with them directly. Uh, probably have time for one more question. They're coming uh, through fast and thick, which is absolutely awesome because we uh, want an engaged audience. So um, the last one is we've adopted the um, IPP challenge and even issued a second uh, reconciliation mm -hmm. action plan. However, the organizations um, that we've discussed will need to show some ROI to the membership fees um, that can be sometime uh, a cost of the business and we do experience this from our end as well yeah. so how do we justify as organization that facilitate the process of connecting social enterprises mm -hmm. and from our from our perspective you know we connect members and procurement professional with a fresh how do we sort of like create the value for money and this yeah, will be yeah. a reflection on our own organizations yeah yeah and uh, i know you guys would experience it as well yeah. as us um look our model has always been on the basis that lists don't create impact, okay? We used to have a publicly available list of social enterprises and hardly anyone did social procurement. So providing a list of certified suppliers is not the answer. Mm -hmm. It's creating systems within organisations. And so our role is to be part of a social procurement system within an organisation. And so that is around strategy and training and engagement and networking events and we find and that's all wrapped up into our membership. There's no cost above and beyond once you join social traders. And we would seek to be part of the development of the thinking about how you do this within the organisation. And where we, we think, you know, we can't actually do it any cheaper than we do it for. i just give you a sense. Our certification and recertification process costs $500,000 a year. Now, that's incredibly expensive incredibly expensive and we don't actually charge our buyers for that at all okay our buyers don't cover the cost of certification we have government and philanthropy currently covering the cost of certification in our organization we don't scale as easily as most businesses because we're a service provider as well if we were just a database it'd be really easy in theory our costs would get cheaper over time because all we do is have uh, you know hopefully 500 buyers who are using our database all paying us a fee and all we really got to cover are the costs of 
uh, certifying those organisations and getting them onto 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 the um, onto a database. That's not what we do because we know that doesn't work fundamentally. So our justification is pretty simple. We're a not-for-profit. This is the most effective way that we can think of delivering the impact that we want. And we price it at a point where we, we, are, we are not close to covering our operating costs as an organisation. We are still, and will be forever, reliant on some philanthropic and government support. So I'm just painting mm -hmm. the opposite image for you, yeah. which is um, if we were to try and put the true cost of what we do into our fees, that would be substantially higher. Thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, I guess the only other comment I'd make is that databases alone aren't the solution um, in general. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. um, I've often had, you know, people who come in, you know, in, in some of the industry groups and go, we just need a database with all of these people on yeah. it and then we can um, make this work. It's like, well, that doesn't address any of the cultural challenges yeah, or systemic right. challenges yeah. that Mark um, was just describing. They are significant. It requires a long-term partnership approach and that... That's the ingredient which has been elusive, that long-term commitment to partnership yeah. over economic cycles, government funding cycles and electoral cycles. You know, that's, those are the, um, that's what is needed, that commitment. Yeah. Absolutely. If I can add from my end, the <laughs> complexity of our of our very own business model, you know, goes beyond sometimes what's, you know, yeah. seen out of the community and the investments in developing a lot of the content, a lot of the knowledge, uh, a lot of the benchmarking around what's considered best practice. You know, we have a freely and publicly available document about uh, procurement best practice called the Global Standard, which is effectively a framework that uh, describes the level of skills required at um, every job level, really from tactical to operational. It's not industry specific, but can be adapted. And all those things that we do as a, as a contribution to the profession require um, a huge amount of effort and resources as well. So um, it is a challenge for, we're not for profit as well, I mentioned yeah. before, a charity. So sometimes things go unseen, uh, but we do try our best to generate value for, for our audience. Um, I'm very mindful of time. It's been an incredibly um, deep and insightful session. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank Mark and Joe for uh, making themselves available Thanks, and sharing Jeff. some mm -hmm. some amazing story. Again, something that's very close to our heart and something that should be close to your heart as well in the, uh, in the quest to uh, improve the social outcomes. And as Mark mentioned before, you know, a human can be huge enabler to create even, um, you know, sustainable and long-term impact. So thank you everyone for, for listening and we will have a second session in February where we'll see an example of a um, social um, procurement in action and we look forward to, to that session and meanwhile, good day to everyone and thanks again to, to Mark and John. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, thanks for listening. Yeah.